actual s velocity, the instantaneous velocity at the different times, is that right? Somewhere. I guess I didn't really label them too well. We did compute the derivative, so the first derivative s prime, that is the velocity. So let's finish these labels. Velocity, well, I'm not going to write velocity at the time because the t value is up at the top there. So it would be velocity at one second, and that negative 9.8 is acceleration. Of course, at the same one second. And then three seconds in, our first number we got, that was s prime velocity. Going much faster, and acceleration the same. Now the reason that we're not, that we don't feel like we're falling right now is because the, there's what's called the normal force that's pushing us up. It's between, it's, if you're standing it's just on your feet, but it's basically the force the earth, put, or the building that you're in puts on. And it cancels out acceleration. So now we'll look at a similar problem, except this time it's going to start with an initial velocity so this is going to be a dynamite blast shooting up a rock, and it's going to go up and then come back down. And we're going to answer some questions on it. <coughs> so a dynamite blast. Shoots a rock up with height function so this the reason I'm calling it height function instead of displacement this is just a vertical displacement function so it starts out you can see pretty easily when t is 0 it'll be 0 height so we're starting the stopwatch uh, at the ground, and then as t increases, we will see that this function, uh, the height will increase up to a point, and you can see that it's a sad parabola, so without doing much work, it's going to sh have a shape like this. Now, of course, we can figure out all the intercepts, and we will do all that, but this is the basic idea. The height function is going to look like this. And we can see at time 0, we're 0, and then we'll go up, have some maximum, and come back down. So let's pretend like we don't know all that already, and we don't know all about quadratics. And let's compute all this with uh, calculus. So we're going to answer some questions. So first one, when does a rock reach maximum height? So you could answer this by using the negative b over 2a, finding your vertex, t value for your vertex, plugging it in and getting a height value. But that would be a pre-calculus way to solve this. So I don't want to go back and solve it with a pre-calculus way. So instead what we're going to do is think about when you reach maximum height, what does that mean about the rate of change, also known as your velocity? So at the exact moment, and I'll redraw that parabola. What is happening with your velocity right at the max? It's, it doesn't get higher, it stops. So think about your velocity. Mm -hmm. So it actually stops. So you have a huge amount of velocity at the beginning when you're first being thrown up, but then you being the rock. But then at some point, gravity keeps accelerating you downwards. So eventually, that, that velocity is going to decrease. And at the very top, it's going to fall back down. So we want to know what is the maximum height? And that's going to happen when the velocity is 0. So I want to figure out when is the velocity 0. So when does rock reach max height? Exactly when velocity is 0. So we're trying to solve v of t 
equals zero, which of course is S prime of T. That's velocity as it relates to position. So we're going to take a derivative, set it equal to zero. So go ahead and do that right now. Take the derivative. You just have a little power rule going on. It's not a tough derivative. And it should be very easy to solve uh, for t. So I did a little bit of algebra before I did calculus, and I didn't have to worry about big numbers and factoring out my 16 later on. So I factored out the 16 when it was super easy. I saw what those numbers were, and I decided to go back. So any questions about t value of 5 for that derivative? So. Does this answer the question, when does a rock reach max height? So, so at, at five seconds, so that's the when. Now, what question is natural to ask after this? We know when it hit max height, but what is the actual maximum height? So let's answer that for part B. So the answer to this is, it's the height at 5 seconds. So all we have to do is take 5, and you want to plug it in to the s function. And my s unfortunately looks like a 5. I try to make my 5 have a flat top on it intentionally, because the rest of my 5 looks just like my s. So take 5 and plug it in for S to see what you get. Probably in feet somewhere. I didn't mention any of that. I think this is measured in feet, yeah. So you'll probably notice I'm bad at arithmetic, so I overuse algebra to avoid uh, doing extra arithmetic. Oh, that's a good question. So I could have written 10 times 5, but I saw already that I was 10 is 2 times 5, and I was going to factor out a 5 squared. So I just went ahead and basically did that already. I mean, you can do the same, same thing like that right there. You still see that there's a 2 times 5 is 10. All right, so we got 400 feet. Next part, so this is part C. The 
find the velocities, there'll be two of them, when the rock is 256 feet above the ground. So let's look at that graph one more time. We know that the max height is 400. So 256 will be, let's say, somewhere right about there and maybe right about there. So it'll be a little more than halfway of the way up and a little more than halfway of the way back down. So I want to know what is the velocity at these two heights. So one problem is I don't have a time value. I, have, I know the velocity. I already computed the velocity uh, function. But I, don't, I can't plug 256 in, because that's a foot measurement, not a seconds or time measurement. So I, if I just go uh, S prime of 256, what I will actually compute is 256 seconds. My function keeps going down, down, down. I'll have a huge negative velocity if I plug that in. So that would not be the right thing to do. So how do I take feet and turn that into a time? I need actually two times here. So we'll go t1 and t2. How do I take feet? What relates feet and time, or height and time? So our height formula right up here. So this is how feet and time are related. So I have to plug in 256 for the right thing. Where do I put 256? Two choices. Do I plug it in for T, which would go all the T's, or do I plug it in for S of T? That'll be my S of T. So that is my number of feet. So this will be 256 equals S of T. And I'm going to use the factored version is 10t minus t squared times 16. 256 seems like there's a factor of 16. Is that just 16 squared? Somebody's better at arithmetic. Square root of 256. 16. 16. All right, so that's right? Yeah. Okay. So cancel out of 16, figure out you should get two t values, not one. And I can tell you one of them should be between 0 and 5 seconds. Just looking at where this graph is should be between 0 and 5. And the other one's going to be bigger than 5. So go ahead and figure out these values. And remember, you're solving quadratic equation. So be careful. You've done this probably 400 times. And you got complete the square, or you can go quadratic formula, or you could go uh, factor and hope you get lucky. Factor only works if there's nice integer uh, roots or nice integer solutions. Just to confirm the square. So there was a, so this 16 canceled one of those powers. I didn't do anything, I just canceled them. I didn't really do anything to cancel them. Yeah, I like to think of multiplying by 1 16th because there really is no division. So if you want my full mental answer is I divide, I multiply by 1 16th. Okay. But if, you want to say divided by 16, that works just as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to notice as you go further in calculus, I'll skip more and more algebra steps. So by the time you hit Calc 3, we'll probably 
you probably won't even see half as many steps as I show now. But there'll be lots of other fun stuff to talk about. All right, so how does this factor? T minus 8, 2 times 8 is 16. And remember, it's positive 16, so that means they're both positive or both negative. And your middle term is negative, so you have to go uh, both negative, not both positive. Now, if this didn't factor nicely, complete the square would have probably been the next best choice that I recommend going. Quadratic formula is OK, but in my opinion, it requires a little too much memorization. And you're usually dealing with larger numbers. You've got to square things, multiply things, take a square root, reduce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think complete the square is usually a little bit better. All right, so we got t values. Does that answer our question? No, we didn't look at all of velocities, so we know times. How do we turn times into velocities? So we got t equals 2 and t equals 8. What function do I use? What if I go s of 2? What will I get? I'll get 256. That's the height, exactly where, it's where we got these from. So if I use s, that's not what I need. What function should I be using? The derivative, that's a good answer to almost any question I ask you. So in this case, it's the actual function I want to use. So I want to take 2 and plug it into s prime, and then do the exact same thing for 8. So plug those into s prime, and you should get two values. And I'll rewrite s prime of t two seconds it was positive 96 and eight seconds it was negative 96 and this is in feet per second so looking at the parabola what this really means these are the actual slopes right here of the parabola. So on the way up, we have a positive velocity, a positive slope. On the way down, we have a negative velocity, negative slope. Now it looks like, the way I drew it, that the slope is 1 and negative 1, approximately. Not 96 and negative 96. So what is very misleading about this graph right here? T1 is 2, T2 is 8. What is our max height? Oh no. 400. So this vertical distance is 400, and this horizontal distance is 8. So our graph is not scaled at all correctly. It should be way, way, way taller than that. So this is a very compressed, vertically compressed graph. So this should be, uh, that's 8. This would probably be, I don't know, 100 feet tall or something like that if I drew if I drew the vertical axis to scale, maybe not 100 feet, but a lot taller. So be a little careful if you try to graph things out. Make sure you either use the same uh, scale on the x and y axis, or be OK with your slopes not, uh, not being accurate. So depending on how graphical you are, if I made this extra steep, 96 times steeper, it would actually be accurate or look accurate. But for us, if your scale is not the same, just positive and negative will still hold true. So if it's going up, it'll still go upwards. If it's going down, negative, it'll still go downwards, even if your scale's not uh, 
not the same in both axes. And there'll be plenty of problems. This problem would be a huge pain if you actually try to graph to scale. It would probably look like this right here, and probably even, even skinnier and taller than I'm drawing right here. So your entire graph, I don't even think I can draw a nice parabola right here, but it looks something like it's pretty useless to graph something on that scale, which is why I didn't try. So we got our two velocities, and a very last part of this problem you can actually do without calculus. When does a rock hit the ground? So the answer to this has nothing to do with the derivative. How do we know the rock hits the ground? So we could think about when it stops, except we saw that our parabola, if we keep graphing it, is going to keep falling down like that. So if you use this to model after whatever time value that we hit the ground, it would be like it fell off a cliff. Like you shot it near the edge of the world, and it just fell off and kept going downwards. So just like any time you model things, generally there is some limits to your time interval of what actually makes sense. So this is only going to be accurate until it hits the ground, and then your velocity is not, this velocity you get out of this equation won't be useful anymore. Just like what happened to the rock before we exploded the dynamite? I don't know. It's not modeled by this. I doubt that it flew out of the ground and then was hit by a dynamite explosion and then perfectly kept going in the same direction. That's very unlikely. Uh, so before zero seconds, this doesn't model that uh, position either. Chances are it was probably sitting there forever. Well, maybe not forever, but certainly for longer than eight seconds, most likely. It was stationary for a long time, and then all of a sudden went up. And assuming it hits the ground, it's probably it may have a little bounce or a roll, but it's basically going to stop when it hits the ground as well. So if you look at, if you extend the time values both directions, it probably looks like this right here. Um, and just thinking about. Uh, this will be a continuous function, however, there'll be right here what we call corner points where your slopes wouldn't match up. So you'd have a zero slope and all of a sudden a huge slope. So that would not be differentiable at those two points. All right, how do we know it hits the ground? Can't go off the velocity now. No, so that would be the velocity v? No, feet. Like the oh, feet, feet. yes. Yeah, so our original position function should be at zero. So I want to know when is the height zero? So that is S of t, we're setting equal to zero. And we already factored the 16. All right, so solve this for T. Now you should get two answers because it's a second degree quadratic. Yep. That'll mess things up a little bit. So which of these two t values is the one I actually want? I think we agree the rock hits the ground one time, unless it takes a bounce. But we're assuming it's not going to bounce. So which t value is the right t value for when it hits the ground? 10. So what does our other t value 0 represent? When it starts. So I wouldn't really call that hitting the ground. It's on the ground, but it's not really hitting the ground. Uh, that t equals 10 is the hit the ground time. So 
So that's the hit the ground, and this is the starting on the ground. So we're going to do one more word problem. Are there any business, economics, finance students here? Only one of you? All right. One and a half. OK. So we'll do one. I don't want to do too many uh, finance problems or biz business problems. There, there are a few in the homeworks you probably saw already. And we're going to look at, I think a lot of the, some of the ones in the homeworks are graphical. So you look at a graph and answer questions off your graph. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned this last class, but just be very careful you read what your graph is. Sometimes it's the derivative of the function they're asking about. And if it is, you need to adjust your thinking accordingly. So don't just assume it's the graph of the function they're asking you about. Sometimes it's the derivative, the graph of the derivative of that function. So we're going to not look at a graphical problem, but uh, a formula problem where we get the formula for the cost and answer questions. So we have what's called a cost function. So C of x is the cost to produce x units. And of course, we can take a derivative. And what does a derivative mean? This is called the marginal cost. And what that means is it's so we know it as the change in the cost. And in the economic sense, it's the basically the if you're already going to build x, it's the cost to build one more unit. So when already producing is a cost to produce one more. So we'll start with a cost function. And we'll keep it as polynomial, so our derivatives are nice and easy. So this is the cost to produce x thingamajiggies. Is thingamajiggies M-A-G-G-I-E-S or M-I-G-G? Think of magiggies. Magig it doesn't matter. So let's produce. What should we call it? Yeah, you can build those. They're pretty. They were very popular last year. I think thingamajiggies are going to be the new thing for this year. Yeah, it's bad to write your problems with like iPods because nobody has those anymore. You need to update all your notes, but thingamajiggies, they're going to be in style forever. So that's why we're building them. So if you build 10, now realistically, you're probably going to build hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, but I don't want to use a calculator, so we're just going to build 10. So these are very exclusive. Build 10, how much, uh, what is the marginal cost? So this is find C prime of 10. 
Now, I don't think I've talked about in this class, you need to take your derivative before you plug in your value. So let's go ahead and violate that rule and see what happens. Let's go ahead and plug in 10 and then take the derivative. And I'll do all this in red. So this is how you would write it. What I'm going to write down is correct, it's just not going to have a meaning that's very useful at all. So order of operations, I'm plugging in 10 first and then taking derivative, just from the way it's written, inside parentheses first. So 10 cubed minus 16 10 squared, 15 times 10. What, I don't actually have to figure out what all these numbers are to know what is the derivative. What is the derivative? Oh, why well, am I taking a t derivative? What variable should I be taking my derivative with? So I want to go x, yeah. So x is our input. It's always your input variable. All right, what is the x derivative of this whole number? Oh, uh, it's a 16. Uh-oh. Is that not? Oh, it should be a 6. All right. Either way, what's the derivative of every single number? Zero. Doesn't matter what the number is. It's going to be zero. So if you take a derivative and get zero, it could be one of two things. You may have plugged in your value already, or uh, if your derivative is just 0, uh, appears to be 0 for all values, then you most likely plugged in a value first and then took your derivative. The only function that has 0 derivative everywhere is a horizontal line. That's the only function that you would expect to have a 0 derivative. Is a, so a function actually has a slope 0 everywhere. That's a horizontal line. Uh, let's go ahead. So you'll get 0 if you plug in your value first. So that's what not to do. Now I do want to know c of 10, so let's go ahead and actually figure out c of 10. It's not going to relate to the uh, cost to build one more, but we do want to find c of 10 later on. So we got 10 cube. So this looks like a tough to compute, but let's factor out a 10 and make our numbers smaller. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm stuck on the last 16 from the other problem because there are 16 all over that problem. So now we got 100 minus 60 is 40 plus 15 is at 55. Hopefully. 55, so 550. All right, so that's cost to build 10. Still not the answer to the question. If we build 10, it didn't say what's the cost to build 10, but what's the marginal cost? So let's answer the actual question. So we need to go C prime of 10 the r correct way. So first, you need to go C prime of just x. And once you figure that out, then you plug 10 in. So this is just a, where's our C function? Just a poly, I can't, oh, here we go. We'll just write ddx and rewrite C function. x cubed minus 6x squared plus 15x. So take that derivative and then plug in 10 afterwards.
have any questions on computing the C of 10. Or C prime of 10, sorry. So now we're going to find the actual cost to produce 10 units. Well, we found the cost to produce 10. We'll find the actual cost to produce 11 and see that we have a discrepancy. So we got actual costs. C of 10 is 550. C of 11, I already computed, is 770, hopefully. So the actual difference, C of 11 minus C of 10. We get 220. So the actual cost to produce one more unit is $220, but using calculus, we got 195. So we got a slight discrepancy. So what is going on here? Let's graph this accurately. So we'll go over. And before we graph it, I, let's compute one more thing. We're going to do what's called linearize. That's a very fancy word. So we're going to linearize at x equals 10. So this function right here, L of x, what's really going on? All we're doing here is what we did before. We're finding a tangent at 10. So nothing extra fancy. We're just figuring out. And this y prime is evaluated at the x1 value, which of course is y equals mx minus x1 plus y1, which is the, is that the point slope form, I think? Probably not. What's that? Probably not. I think it's like that, you know, y. Yes. Yeah, so, so points. These are. I mean, they're not exactly the same form, but it's trivial to go from one to the other. And I think they're called point slope form. Is that right? Anybody who paid attention in algebra, something, point slope. All right. So I recommend. I've said this before. Use point slope form a little bit more often than the other forms. So slope intercept is useful, but I think point slope form is usually a little faster. And when we go to linearize, it's exactly what you're going to use. So all we're doing here is creating a tangent. Nothing special. So go ahead and figure out. We got numbers. And just fill in all the numbers. You should be looking at a line. So figure out what that line equation is. And I'm going to go and open up a graph. I'm going to graph on Desmos. So I need you to compute the line.
So I need to get this window adjusted. I hit the delete key and it went back to the previous page. So I'm gonna go zero to 11. That was our, this our range of X values we cared about. Maybe I'll go to 12 just to go one past what we need. And our Y axis, we'll go zero to seven, we better go past 770. Let's go zero to 900. So this is a really good example of graph not being to scale. We're going over 11, 12, and going up 900. So those are vastly different numbers. That means is your slope is not going to be to scale. So there is our curve. Now, I'm not an economist or a business person, so this is probably a bad product if you make more and it costs more and more and more to make. Hopefully your curve bends downwards, not upwards like this. Uh, but again, I'm not an economic uh, business person. All right, what is our line? So we got our slope was 195, I think. Can we share the line? In this form? All right, well, looks like we're intersecting here. So that's promising. So we should be intersecting at 10. And that looks like Right where I had that mouse pointer is where they're touching. So let's zoom into that area of the graph. Oops. So I want to basically look between 10 and 11. That should work. So 10 is the sort of bottom part of the graph that you can see where they touch. Now the problem is our estimate assumed that this went in a straight line and our curve actually curved away from that line. So the more curve, uh, the higher the curvature, basically the more that this function curves, the less accurate this is going to be. So you can already see the discrepancy that we saw was the difference between where my cursor is right here and where the red Y value would be above it. So that was the discrepancy. So as you can see, it's sort of accurate, but better than nothing, but it won't actually give you the exact cost. Um, another thing to notice, anytime that you use math to model something, there's always a inherent inaccuracy in there. So you can't measure things perfectly. Um, things will always be changing. So you can't say the cost this year won't be the cost next year, it won't be the cost the year after, it changes all the time. So that is the discrepancy that we saw. So any questions while we're looking at the graph? I recommend take some of your problems and go over to Desmos and graph them because it will give you some insight. You might say, oh, it looks like I intersected the right way, but maybe my slope's off. It will give you some indications of uh, what, your, uh, what the issue is. And you can also zoom into your intersection point, and the further you zoom in, the more these two functions should look exactly the same. So if we were making a tenth of a thingamajiggy, then this would be pretty accurate. We'd be accurate within whatever, some pennies or something like that. So trig derivatives are up next. I think it's a good idea to save those till tomorrow.